Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I hope you cannot hear me clearly today. Um, Halloween is uh, just around the corner. And, uh, you know, we got very lucky uh, with this particular session of ours to uh, make sure that this particular session was you know, special for all of us. We were able to get uh, a fantastic author, Phil Barden. Uh, the book we will talk about is uh, still the beast is feeding <laughs> and we're going to talk about 40 years of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's a fantastic movie. It came around 40 years back. Tim Curry and Susan Sarandon. Science fiction. Ooh. And, uh, Perfect. <laughs> all right, guys, couldn't resist that one. But that was one uh, uh, funny uh, thing which happened when I was searching for the other books because I wanted to read um, what else Phil has written, you know, I got my hands on this book, guys, uh, those who can uh, take a look, it's lovely, feels fantastic. Um, we will discuss the book in details. And uh, the lovely thing about this particular book was like, uh, there's a certain almost gravitas, you can say to it, when you hold it in your hands, you can feel it's different. And Phil said, uh, told me, I think there was a reason behind the way the book is. And if we remember from one of our last sessions with uh, Brie William, uh, she said, it, it's kind of funny how many folks in the world of behavioral science and behavioral strategy don't seem to be using behavioral science when it comes to presenting their own work. And I think this book is a perfect example of how you should present your work with the quality of paper, the colors, and the way the chapters are arranged, right? When each chapter ends, you have like short takeaways. So you can read uh, and then uh, you got your blurbs out there for cognitive ease. And say a week from now, whenever you want to do a quick recap, you have all the important points, uh, you know, marked out there already for you. Six months down the line, you want to again revisit the book. You can straight up go down, go down to this uh, end of chapter summaries which are like what we have learned in this chapter and what this means to us as marketeers. Overall, fantastic book. Uh, please welcome Phil out here, Phil Warden. Um, Phil has had a fantastic career before uh, he uh, joined Decoded as Managing Director UK. And uh, his book, Decoded, consistently ranks as one of the best uh, books out there on behavioral science, as well as books on marketing. Uh, it came out almost eight years back. And uh, by looking at the reaction of people who realized Phil was joining us, and with all the posts we started going around, we realized people still very much are buying, reading, and are looking forward to this event. Phil, welcome to the Behavioral Science Club. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, guys, we'll do the usual thing. Uh, I'll start up with a couple of questions. Uh, today, Michael is going to be co-hosting. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as usual, very soon, we'll start taking up all the questions from the audience. Uh, Louis is going to start, uh, Louis is going to start making a note of them. And uh, so Phil doesn't have to worry about keeping an eye on the questions separately, right? We'll make life easy. So please keep those questions coming. Uh, so Phil, uh, as I was reading the book, right, um, right there in the beginning, you had a fantastic story. Uh, it goes around mental models. And uh, it ties beautifully to what happened in around 2010 with uh, the dance campaign, right? I think we want to start the, uh, the day today with uh, going back to that campaign. What was happening there? What was Phil Barden doing just before that? And uh, you've been mm. working almost since the 80s, 82. Um, in the field of marketing. So you, you talked about how you have built a good amount of uh, mental models till you reach a particular point in life and you had a certain realization. Can you please tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I, I, um, I spent most of my career in marketing at Unilever, which as many of you will know is almost like a marketing university. You know, you are like Oxford or Cambridge, you go to Unilever or Procter and & Gamble, and um, you certainly get trained very well. And that probably breeds a little bit of 
dare I say, arrogance that you know it all, that you know how brands work, you know how communication works, you know how, how to influence behavior. Um, so I, I felt I knew a lot and I then went to Diageo, spent a few years there. And then my last client side role was at T-Mobile. Um, and uh, I was the VP for the brand uh, in Europe. I had to relaunch and reposition the brand. And I spent a huge amount of money and a lot of time uh, deploying a research technique that I'd used at uh, Unilever um, to understand the categories in the brand uh, around in 14 different European countries. Um, and it was the results won't make you a lot of sense and it's causing a lot of frustration with the local operating companies and the vendor the research vendor couldn't couldn't help they just said well look you know the results are what the results are um, and I was really worried because I I'd persuaded the business to invest heavily I mean like six figures um, high six figures in in research uh, fees and um, someone introduced me to a couple of guys from Decode uh, in Germany. It was founded in Germany. And I met these guys. And one of them is a neuroscientist and the other is a cognitive psychologist. And um, I thought I'd just try them out. So I, I just, I met them. I asked them a few questions. Uh, you know, I've got this ad here. It researched well, and yet it's just not working in the market. Why do you think that might be? And they looked at the ad and within, 20 seconds they gave me an answer that sounded incredibly plausible so I tested them with a few more things and each and every time they could explain what was going on and why something was working or something wasn't working and, and I asked them how do you know well, tell me what are you what are you employing what are you using to explain this and they said well what we know about human behavior and don't forget that science and academia have been studying human behavior for decades and so we're using what's known uh, and i said well that's amazing that you guys know this and they said no what's amazing is that you don't know this and that was quite a uh, a sort of a smack in the face for me because i i thought i hang on i do know this you know i spent a lot of my years as a, as a managing brands in unilever um i know this stuff and and yet there was a whole different world um, of explanation. So the long and the short of it was I, I, at great personal risk, I canceled the research program that was ongoing and commissioned Decode to run their version of, uh, of understanding motivations in the category and the brand uh, around, around Europe. And they used a completely different research technique, so-called implicit testing, which grew out of social psychology because social psychologists had known for 30 or 40 years that what people say and what people do can be very different things. And yet I'd never ever heard of this in, in marketing, in consumer research in marketing. So they explain kind of the, the, um, the paradigms and, uh, and, and the concepts behind it, and it seemed to make sense. They then explain how they knew from their work, how the brain makes a decision, um, how the brain values different brands as being a, a, a strong or a weaker fit against certain goals. And this was a, a, a new concept to me as well, a new mental model. And so we deployed the research and, and suddenly it all seemed to make sense. And so the findings from the research were used then to craft a new brand positioning uh, and proposition, which was all around this idea of life is for sharing um, and memorable moments to share. And that, that was the, um, the communication platform. And that's, that's what was given as a brief to the ad agencies and um, along with a set of goals um, I talk about goals a lot in Decoded chapter six is all about goals and, and what I've come to learn is fundamentally human motivation is goal oriented um, so having having um, derived from this quantitative research what the goals were that were going to be motivating in the category and would make T-Mobile not only relevant but distinctive we put those into the brief as well 
So we explained to the agencies what the concept was. So the creative job was to bring these goals to life. And the first example, most famously, was, was in the UK with um, Paul, um, with uh, this uh, Liverpool Street, um, the London t uh, Rail Terminus, the flash mob idea. So um, the, uh, the tannoy announces the trains and then all of a sudden music starts and a few people start dancing and then over the space of the next minute or so, this sort of infectious spontaneity spreads and people more, more and more people join in a mass dance. Um, and the in really interesting thing was that that ad doesn't show any product. It didn't talk about price or promotion or, or, or network coverage or call quality. Uh, and we thought it was a bit of a risk, to be honest, but the results absolutely astonished us. Within 48 hours of that ad going out on air, footfall, sort of traffic into the, the T-Mobile stores in the UK doubled. And the sales director and the sales teams contacted marketing and said, why didn't you tell us that you'd booked all this local store activation activity? And we said, well, we didn't tell you because we didn't book any. There isn't any local store activation activity. Why, why are you asking? And they said, because the, the store managers are reporting this twice that they've got monitors on the doors that measure footfall. Twice the footfall. Uh, and this was amazing. And, and then, we, then we started to pick up share um, and revenue started to increase, the people on the, on the service as well as new people coming in. We measured brand consideration, that tripled. Um, and ultimately we spawned something like 70 Facebook groups. Um, this was before Instagram, by the way, uh, or Pinterest or anything like that. But we had Facebook, we had YouTube. It's got 41 million YouTube views. Um, which for those um, in the audience who know about John Lewis Christmas advertising in the UK and how famous that is, 41 million, million is more than any John Lewis Christmas ad. So it was an astonishing response. And I had never seen anything like that, nor had the business. And when I told the guys from Decode, this is amazing. We're, we're all astonished. They, they, they were quite bemused. And they said, well, why, why are you surprised? Because we deliberately coded into that ad motivators of behavior. It's all about goal orientation and, and, and the creatives brought that to life brilliantly. So why are you surprised that people are behaving in the way you wanted them to? And that was a real eye opener. I had never seen such a powerful cause and effect in my entire career. And I asked the, the deco guys, you know, this is, this is fundamental. I mean, marketing ultimately and essentially, is about behavior, right? And behavior change, buy my brand, buy more of it, switch brands, tell people about it, whatever it might be, it's about human behavior. Uh, and I asked the Deco guys to um, point me in the direction of some literature, and they gave me the sort of popular psychology books that were around at the time. So um, Predictably Irrational uh, um, from Dan Ariely and How We Decide by Joan Lehrer. And I read those and I thought, oh, this, this is incredible. You know, there's all this stuff about human behavior that I, I just wasn't aware of. Uh, and then they gave me some fairly easy to read um, academic papers, because if anyone here has read academic papers, you'll know they are pretty impenetrable unless you're an academic. You know, they're written in, <laughs> in a foreign language. Um, and the more I read and the more I understood, the more excited I got because I, this just spoke to the heart of, of the core of marketing to me. And, and then having witnessed the, the power of the results, um, I grew more and more convinced that I wanted to be part of it. So I, I, I said to the guys, look, you know, you, you're operating out of Germany. Have you ever thought of having a UK office? And they said, no, uh, why? And I said, because I'd, I'd be, very keen to start the business in the UK. And they said, fine, do it. If you want to do it, you know, we'll, we'll coach you. Um, I'm not, not a scientist by background. Um, but that, that may have helped actually writing decoded um, because I've come at it very much from a uh, marketeer's point of view and a, a layman's uh, point of view. So I hope I've managed to sort of explain concepts and things in a way that, that is readily understandable. But, but it, along the way, what they told me and taught me and what I read really some of it was easy to grasp a lot of it was very difficult to grasp because it it challenged 
years of uh, of my own mental models that I'd grown up with, and and I now know there's even a name for that, the Semmelweis reflex, which is the the tendency to reject new information if it contradicts our existing mental models, and that's because we are all prone to our uh, the power of our own system one, right? Implicit system which the tendency is to default to the status quo, and that's why change management per se is very is very difficult because it's effortful to think uh, and reflect and, and process all of this stuff. But um, you know there are shortcuts to that, and one of them was was my own experience was actually learning and, and seeing that uh, in action. Uh, and that helped, but I think that you know the switch from of mental models was was tough. And I'm I'm looking back over my career. I wish I'd done a psychology degree, uh, and I and I envy uh, those who are um, come new graduates studying. There's a vast number of degrees around now, undergraduate and postgraduate uh, in in various fields of neuropsychology. Um, I do envy them because they'll come into the workplace with a better frame of thinking than, than we had you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. So that's a bit of a long answer about a T-Mobile dance, but I hope that's kicked that, us that off. That's the perfect answer, uh, Phil. So uh, uh, the thing about our group is uh, you have members across the range. We have people who are professors and PhDs in this group and double PhDs and running their own podcasts. At the same time, we also have people who just know the word nudge and right. they don't okay. really know what nudge means and they're starting in their journey, right? And for them to find out uh, or for them to realize that you picked it up, working with a group of scientists, working with, with certain books, and then you found a way to make this a fantastic career, write a phen phenomenal book about it. Uh, while you do, while you are saying, you know, you envy the ones who are coming down with a degree and the knowledge because it gives them that fantastic head start. I think it also gives a lot of confidence to people in the group to say, well, I think that I think we can also pick it up. Not all of us will be mm. able to go and do a, a master's or a, or a PhD in it. Now, mm. which brings us to the next question. In your book, you say, and it's a scary survey that you mentioned, uh, around 1,200 CEOs from North America, Europe, and APAC who was surveyed and almost 80% of them said they believe marketeers are disconnected from business results. And this, these are the CEOs who are saying this about their teams. And yeah. I'm assuming this was around 10 years back. Now in, in the last decade, we've had a lot more people winning Nobel Prize for Behavioral Economics. Uh, it's pretty much uh, out there. People know about it. There are phenomenal fests around it. Uh, almost rock star writers and you know they've almost become celebrities in their rights. When you today work with uh, folks through Decode and as you talk and you speak with uh, marketeers and CEOs, do you think there has been a change out there or, or are we still going with this old mental model like IDA and hierarchy of needs? Uh, can mm. you please tell us about that more? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, I see from my work with clients and what I read uh, in the industry press, I think there's a real mixture. I think generally there is far more awareness now of um, the whole, all of the behavioral sciences. Um, but there, in my view, there's still a lack of translation of the theory into practice. There's a lot of people talking theory still. Um, but when it comes to, so what do I do? How does this help me sell more or retain customers or whatever? There, there's still a, a lack of application. Um, but I also see a continuing trend in marketeers. And this, this has been going on for a long, long time. Um, someone had, the, I heard a lot the phrase was marketing is the dog that barks at every passing car. And it's almost like, you know, when there's something new, we jump on it. You know, whether it's whether it's Instagram or TikTok or or whatever, we kind of we we pile it or brand purpose or whatever it might be. There's a kind of flavor of the month or flavor of the year, and people jump on that. Um, and I think I believe they lose sight of some of the fundamentals. It's like, yeah, fine. You know, embrace embrace 
new uh, media and, and channels. That's absolutely fine. But why are you doing that? They have to serve you in some way. What, what's, your, what's your core objective? You know, ultimately, you have to sell more stuff. You're helping the business generate revenue, which is its lifeblood, and, you have, and the business has to be sustainable in the long term. And you may tactically choose different ways of doing that, but ultimately, this is about human behavior. So don't obsess over stuff that might be gone tomorrow. Obsess over fundamentals. And that's where I think um, trying to get behavioral sciences into maybe some formal training within companies and, and with industry bodies can only be can only be a good thing. Thanks a lot, Phil. That's a great introduction and thanks so much, Prakash. And uh, I can't say I'm not disappointed. I thought it was going to be a Rocky Horror sing-along there. But, uh, <laughs> we'll do that later, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That would have just pressed my button, okay. Um, but yeah, you're very welcome, Phil, and you're welcome everybody here today as usual. It's great to see so many regular faces and it's great to see new people joining us. And if you don't mind turning your camera on, we'd love to see you. And um, so I'm going to hand over quite soon to Michael. Michael's got all of the more technical questions <laughs> in relation to the book. But Phil, we had a little chat in the week. And like Prakash said, I think it's actually really appealing to our members, your story that you came to behavioral science and the realization almost later in your career, because it gives you know that gives such hope to people who are very keen about behavioral science but don't have an academic background so i think that's a very uplifting story to share i'm also interested in maybe your views about having worked in marketing first and we talked a little about your early career right? do you think that um people coming new to marketing now who come on a very different journey because it's a digital journey now as opposed to the traditional journey of like you say things like going out to factories and things like that do you think it's all better or do you think there's anything lost i think it's just different and i think it it still boils down to whether one is selling a product or a service um and if you're selling a product i i would argue there's no substitute for getting experience in other parts of the business that marketing inevitably touches and tries to influence. So when we talked, you know, I said I spent six months in a biscuit factory and then six months selling biscuits uh, out of a car in South London because I knew my career initially was about marketing biscuits. So I was going to be making, asking the factory to make changes to packaging or, or whatever. And I was going to ask the, the sales teams to do certain things. So having had, albeit, relatively little experience compared to the people who worked there for years every little helped it gave me a better appreciation for the impact that marketing has across a business um, and it also helped me speak their language a little bit and and i and i felt genuinely um, gave me a bit of an advantage versus people who hadn't had that experience i think it's different if you're selling a service i mean you know you have to use the service. You have to try and be a user of the service or ask friends or family who are using that service or similar services in order to try and get uh, the same sort of hands-on experience, if you like, or be it intangible versus, versus tangible. It also depends fundamentally what the role of marketing is in a business. Um, because, you know, I've worked in, in companies where marketing was, you, you were like managing director of the brand. You were profit accountable down to, down to gross margin level. And that meant you were very much the, the hub in the center of the wheel. And I've worked in other businesses where marketing's job is just advertising and communications uh, with, with hardly any uh, relationship to product or customer experience or other brand touch points. So I think it it definitely depends what role uh, marketing has uh, in the business. Thanks. Yeah, that's very, very apt. You're right. Uh, the, the role can be very different uh, depending on the company, the product, the brand, and sort of making me think of uh, 
Emily goes to Paris who's so focused on her, her, her social media selling, which has been driving everybody mad recently. Um, so I'm going to quickly hand over to Michael now. As Prakash said, there's many fans of your book out there. And um, Michael mentioned to me straight away that it was a book that he really had enjoyed and got a lot from, as I'm sure other members have. Um, so Michael offered to uh, assist me here today in co-hosting. Uh, we've had Michael here before, so I'll hand over to you now, Michael. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Louise. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So uh, I pretty much begged Louise and Prakash <laughs> to be able to do this. Phil, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Your book is superb. It's probably my favourite um, of the Thank books you. in that kind of world right up there with unconscious branding, neurodesign, those kind of books. Um, got my copy here. I've got, it's full of underlines and I had a whole bunch of questions I wanted to run by you. But the first thing that I thought I'd ask is um, for people that obviously haven't read the book yet and aren't familiar with this method, the coded method that works so successfully, I want to give you an example of something that happened in the real world to me recently and get your take on it and maybe how you would approach that problem using this method. So mm -hmm. I work for a uh, managed service provider here in Southwest Missouri, and um, they, they found out that their clients were very nervous about being locked into long-term contracts. And we have to do that, unfortunately, just to, to derive maximum value for the clients. It sometimes takes them time. But they did something very odd. And I remember when they did it at the time, and I just finished reading your book, and I thought, I don't know about that. I'd love to know what Phil would make of this. They sent boxes with handcuffs to each of their um, prospects saying we promise we won't lock you in and I just like to get your impression of that because it struck me as odd because the first thing I thought is if I receive the pair of handcuffs what's the first automatic association I'm going to have well it's being tracked so mm. I'd love to just hear more about the methods if, if it's possible and maybe mm. relating it to that example how you might maybe tackle something like that <laughs> Firstly, thank you, Michael. Likewise, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for your very kind words uh, about decoded. Um, my visceral reaction when you gave that example was exactly the same as yours. If I'd unboxed a pair of handcuffs, the most salient associations and what happens immediately in, in, in your associative memory is captivity uh, and constraint. Um, even though the line is, you know, we promise not to lock you in or, or whatever it was. Um, I, my personal view is it would backfire because it's, because it's actually, it's a tangible signal. And this is very important for the brain. It's not like we're trying to imagine something. You have actually presented someone physically with a pair of handcuffs and tangibility is something that the autopilot system one responds to uh, very much. Uh, so it's a real signal um, of, uh, of constraint. So yeah, I wouldn't have advised that one. And let's say you were advising a company to go through this process. What are the kind of things that you would do? Would it, would it mainly start with trying to do some kind of a, a implicit bias um, association testing or something like that to try and figure out in that world, what are the positive things that people have associations with and then, and then mm -hmm. kind of link that to uh, copywriting or to branding, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, we, we always start with um, what's the behaviour you're seeking or what behaviour are you trying to change so that we, we can try and understand what, uh, what barriers there may be to, uh, to change. Um, and we also always start with the fundamental concept, which is in Decoded, of um, reward minus pain. So for people who haven't read the book, basically purchase decisions are based on, on the net value which the brain computes subconsciously in, in milliseconds between the expected um, reward uh, that I'm going to get, so what, crudely what's in it for me, um, and the pain involved in acquiring the reward, which is a mixture of uh, a combination of price and behavioural cost, so the time and effort involved in, in acquiring the reward. And this, this stems from some empirical work at Stanford um, University where people were put in fMRI brain scanners and asked to make brand and product purchase decisions based on 
seeing an image of a brand and then the price of the brand and they were given time to to perceive both and then to make a choice whether they would buy the brand for the price or not and what the scientists looked at was simply the activation in the brain in various regions in the brain um, at those points in time and when the brand was perceived the so-called reward center in the brain was triggered part of the orbitofrontal cortex which is known to be involved in in valuation of of choices uh, and those valuations are based on the expected outcome that we'll, we'll achieve and those expectations are based on the associations that we've learned um, of the choice over time uh, so you know if we're looking for a a watch um, that is a status symbol then certain brands will have a higher uh, valuation in the reward center than others same with any any category or any any brand um, and then the pain activation was in another part of the brain the insula which is is also linked with physical social pain and uh, and disgust uh, and so there seemed to be the brain was responding to price uh, in a very hot way it's like you're asking me to part with money which i value highly to acquire the reward and that that hurts in a way um, and then whether or not the subject decided to buy the brand for that price is based on crudely the levels of activation in the two different areas. And the scientists found they could predict whether the subject would, would buy or not based on what was going on in, in, these, uh, in activation in these two brain regions. So we would always start with this, what, what reward are people seeking from the product or service? Uh, and what is the likely pain involved in, in price, time, and, and effort? Um, some, some, can, some jobs that we work on, we can, um, we can do this on a consultancy basis, but other jobs that we work on require more of an empirical basis because whilst it's true to say there are rewards involved in, any, in acquiring any, uh, or sorry, in purchasing any brand or product or service, you might not know necessarily what those rewards are or what the relative um, strength of the rewards is in terms of driving uh, that purchase. And that's where we, that's where we turn to the empirical um, solution, where we can actually, uh, using a, an implicit technique, so a reaction time technique, which accesses system and measures system one, so the automatic spontaneous response rather than a reflective thought through controlled response, we can get a we can assess the strength of uh, different different goals um, at a functional level but also at a social emotional and psychological level to see what drives purchase in a category and then what drives purchase for each of the brands within that category and that helps us understand relevance um, so what's the overlap between your brand's goals and the category goals and it helps us also understand distinctiveness, which is the degree to which a brand owns a category goal um, uniquely. Uh, and, and that type of approach we've applied since Decode started. That's exactly what we did with T-Mobile. That was the, the foundational research. And we've, we've applied it around the world and many different categories and across di different demographies. And it, um, it worked because it's based on human neuropsychology, which is, which is you know, pretty universal at, um, uh, in terms of the, the goals. Um, obviously there are different, there can be differences by culture. Um, certain goals may be more or less um, important. There can be differences and are differences by life stage as well. Uh, goals become more or less relevant to us as we move through different life stages. So this, this approach takes that, that into account. So that's, that's if we were to do a really sort of thorough, uh, decoding of, uh, of, of a situation that's what we would look at so what are the goals how do they um, rank relative to each other so what are the which goals are the real drivers and then how does your brand stack up against those versus competition so where are the opportunities for you what's credible for your brand to um, to deliver and, and what's not um, and how might you how might you attack a competitor or, or entice a competitors buyers, for example.
That was awesome, thank you. And I do have a quick side question. It's not one of the ones I had laid out originally, but it just dawned on me. So just quickly, um, have you ever been approached by any uh, political campaigns? Because I could see this being extremely powerful in the world of politics. No, we haven't. Um, we have done, we recently did some uh, implicit testing in, in Germany. Um, which I think has been published in the German media, which looked at, and this is uh, to describe the framing effect in, in Decoded, I'll give the example of, of the same piece of news uh, imparted by two different uh, news owners like the Times newspaper or the Sun newspaper in the UK, a real you know, tabloid. Um, in Germany, we, we tested the same political message uh, imparted by three different political parties and the perception of the message was significantly different depending on which party had given the message so that's what you know what we know as a, as a framing effect um, this this effect that either a brand or a person or a party in this case political party kind of it radiates some implicit effect onto the the product in the case of a brand or or the message in case of um, politics so yes, you can you can apply it to uh, to that as well. Yeah, that makes me wonder if what it was was if people have a certain the the effect that you mentioned earlier on. They believe that a certain party um, holds true to these values, and, and they present a message that clashes with that belief. You'd probably immediately dismiss it. So I can see maybe where that might mm -hmm. come in as well. Um, so what was interesting is because I, I read all these different books and I see a lot of patterns developing. And so I was going through, this is from um, your goals chapter in the first edition. And uh, so you were talking about um, human behavior and motivation. And you say here, uh, human motivation is of course more elaborate than just prevention and promotion, which kind of you, you mentioned earlier on the, the positives and the negatives. Uh, various scientific disciplines, including effective neuroscience and the psychology of motivation show that our the rudimentary motivations of prevention and promotion, they're developed what we might call the big three human motivations. And as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, oh yeah, here we go. Now he's gonna get into self-determination theory. And you didn't, and you went into the, this completely different thing. Um, so instead of, um, what is it, autonomy, um, relatedness and competence, you did security, autonomy and excitement. So I'm very intrigued to hear where that came from, and if you even looked at self-determination theory and how you balance the two against each other, if you throw self-determination mm. theory out, that was new to me, and I found that very interesting. Mm. No, thank you. Yeah, the um, the model that we use, which is in which is in uh, chapter six uh, of Decoded, comes from a number of sources. Um, most of them are social psychology, um, in particular one which is um, uh, German psychologist called Norbert Bisch, Bischhoff, uh, who's a social psychologist. Um, but because our founders come at this from two different disciplines, one from psychology and the other from neuroscience, it also built in effective neuroscience as well. So we've got something like, uh, I think it's about eight different sources that all tend to, to show very similar things. They might talk about these three, big three in slightly different ways. They might give them different names, for example. So autonomy, someone else calls the rage system. Um, but at, at, at its heart, it, it's, there's a massive amount of overlap. And that's what really appealed to me as a marketeer. This was where it seemed to me that a lot of scientific and academic fields were correlated and, and, and overlapped in their, in their thinking and, and, and agreement. So um, self-determination, yes, we, we would class that as uh, within the autonomy territory. What I don't do in Decoded, because uh, it's our intellectual property, is give the full detail of the content of each of the fields within our six field model. So whilst we've got the big three, which is, as you say, excitement, autonomy, and security, Within security, for example, when we're doing any, any work, whether it's quantitative or, or consultancy, we look at security in term, more holistically in terms of things like caring for yourself, caring for others, closeness, warmth, belonging, trust, 
tradition, protection, reassurance. So there's 10 I've just named off the top of my head. We've got roughly 20 um, goals that we, that we have in each of the six uh, fields that we use when we're doing our, our work. Um, so yes, I'd say it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's pretty comprehensive. Thank you. And my final question before um, Prakash and Louise open this up for the overall Q&A. Tell me about the second edition. I've been waiting for it for so long. <laughs> Tell me all about it. I, I, I read the blurb that I found on Amazon and I saw apparently you guys are bringing in jobs to be done theory. So I'm really interested in hearing like, when can we expect yeah. it? What's the new material and what kind of stuff have you guys learned since you wrote the first edition? Thank you. Yeah, and I, I've been waiting. <laughs> my, don't talk to my publisher. They've been waiting for it for a long time as well. Um, unfortunately, life and, and work have, have been getting in the way somewhat, but, but it's, it's, it, the revisions and updates are nearly complete. So the, the things that I've put into the second edition, largely based on feedback from readers, um, firstly, there's going to be a bit devoted to business to business because a lot of people have said to me that um, the majority of examples that I give are business to consumer and consumer brand. But what about business to business? You know, surely that's different. It's so-called uh, more rational than, uh, than, than anything else. So there, there, there'll be a large bit devoted to, to B2B, um, which is fascinating. I mean, just to give you a kind of headline, you know, it's, it's business to business, but it's still human to human, right? And it's with the, the um, Rory Southern has done this lovely bit with the B2B Institute on LinkedIn. He's written a paper called The Objectivity Trap, and I'm, and I'm gonna quote from it because some of his phrases, typical Rory, are wonderful. He talks about the, the myth of rationality, the fact that we assume that as soon as someone puts on a suit and arrives in an office, that suddenly they, they kind of swap brains and they become immediately homo economicus with access to perfect information and they're not prone to any cognitive biases at all. You know, ignoring the fact that they've, they've been exposed to B2C communications they are a consumer themselves etc cetera, etc cetera. but of course there are big differences you know the the nature of the decision is often a lot more significant both in terms of um, comfort, corporate and personal risk there are many more people involved in the decision than buying a packet of detergent and um, uh, the whole matrix you know who is this there are many stakeholders and who what's driving each of the stakeholders as well. So, you know, relating it back to goals and reward and pain. Um, so that, that, that's, that's one bit. Um, an update on emotion versus rational, I think is, is important as well. And I've, I've, you know, we've put a few papers out about that. And I saw one of the questions uh, that came in from Subash was, was about that as well, which I'd be very happy to answer. Um, Jobs to be done is expanding on that, which I introduced um, uh, in, in Decoded. And it's, it's something we're using increasingly. It's quite a nice, nice way to think about this. I think you know, Clayton Christensen conceived the idea that, that we hire products or services to do a job to be done. You know, famously, we don't buy a quarter inch drill because we want a quarter inch drill. We need a quarter inch hole to be drilled. That's the job to be done. Um, and then and then working back to the associations that brands have with the instrumentality greater or lesser than each other to, to help us achieve that job. So that that's another part um, that, that will be updated. Quite a few new cases and studies, uh, some that we've run ourselves um, as well, which I think are interesting, where we've looked at um, a case we've done with with Ferrero, the confectionery company, looking at how people respond to different um, point of sale visuals in terms of reward center activation in the brain. We found a, a strong and positive correlation between reward center activation and actual sales um, caused by those visuals. So the big testing protocol looking at putting these different visuals in, in stores. Um, so that was one thing, but then we also linked that with implicit testing of the brand to find out what the associations are of the brand and implicit testing of the visuals to find the associations of the visuals. And we've got it's a lovely um, story that, uh, that all works together 
that the associations we've learned to, uh, with the brand over many years um, are fit absolutely with the associations that are conveyed by these different point of sale visuals. So the one that has the strongest fit with the brand was also the one that activated the reward center the most, and that was also the one that sold most. So, you know, we've taken the th what is theory and absolutely proven it in, in practice as well. So yeah, those, um, those are probably the, some of the notable ones. Uh, update, quite a big update on distinctive brand assets as well, which has become in the intervening years more famous thanks to uh, Byron Sharp and the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. So I mean, we do a massive amount of, of that testing as well uh, globally. So I'll be introducing some of the findings from, from that too. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure to meet you and to have you answer these questions. And I'm going to turn it back over to Louise and Prakash now. Thank you, guys. By the way, Prakash, I love the new hairstyle. I think it's awesome. Suits you really well. <laughs> I follow the lead of Tooney. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you, Michael. They were excellent questions and um, super answers from you, Phil, and makes us all now think we're going to have to buy a second book of yours so I'm sure you'll be delighted mm. about that <laughs> and um, so you mentioned that you would noticed uh, the question there from Subash who today wins the prize for the most questions in one post I think I can count uh -huh. about five different questions there but maybe Subash you'd like to take yourself off and and choose one of them you can't have all five <laughs> absolutely oh that that's thanks uh, thanks Lewis and uh, I mean Phil uh, I mean uh, good evening from India Okay, I have a question. I'm going to reverse the entire order. So Phil, what's your point of view on the book Absolute Value, which they build a very strong thesis against brands, not to say from, um, in, from the classical sense. Because a couple of days back, I went through that process where I choose an Indian brand who was half the price against a German brand. And because the reviews were so startlingly different and the price difference was so big. So I want to, is our brands losing its value where information is becoming more democratic in nature, Phil? What's your, what's your take on that? That's interesting, Subash. Thank you. I confess I haven't read the book, Absolute Value. Oh. Okay. So okay. I'm going to have to respond to your question, but I'll put it on my list for, uh, for reading. Um, it, from what you've said, uh, the answer is it always comes back to reward minus pain, perceived reward versus perceived pain. Um, and very often we will switch brands if the equation tips, if it moves. Um, so if, if, um, if the difference in pain is significant, as you've outlined there, in terms of price difference, then we are willing to make a trade-off in reward. You know, the, the brain always sees price as a signal of reward itself, and there's kind of, it's commensurate with reward. But there comes a point where you think, well, come on, it can't, you know, it can't be that bad. And, um, and maybe if it's, you know, if there could be other rewards involved with buying a, a local brand, an Indian brand versus a foreign brand as well. You might want to support local manufacturing and economy, for example. So there are, it, it still comes back to reward minus pain. Okay. It's why we buy things on, on you know, we, 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 uh, we have one client who was, whose brand was always on sale. They always, their advertising was always our best ever price. Um, and our, our advice to them was, because they said we're, we're our kind of our brand is being eroded over time and our, our quality perception. And I said, that's because no one knows what your, what your reward is. You know, you, it, we accept that brands go on sale. We accept flash sales, seasonal sales, whatever it might be. But you can't keep your brand on permanent sale because you haven't ever anchored it at any particular price to know what its quality is. Whereas, so, so in your in in your example, you have the German brand at a certain price has a certain price quality relationship. The Indian brand at a different price has a has another price quality relationship, and that may be totally acceptable. Right. So but it's very to continue Sorry, on that question, I mean, I think in absolute value, the thesis is built on saying that with uh, uh, what you call platforms like Amazon and Yelp, even very small brands who don't have a legacy, it's built on reviews of customers. Yeah. So okay. the, the classical notion of having a brand which uh, uh, what you call 
stands for value and trust. It doesn't hold any good in the, that's the thesis of the, the book. I'm not saying it's absolutely right, mm. but it's a, it's a counter theory to the way classically people look at brands. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I mean, reviews, um, you know, um, leverage social proof of social norms as, a, as a strong absolutely. heuristic that that's, that's very clear. And when we are uncertain in a particular category, we certainly look for security and that's what reviews can, can give us. That's, there's no doubt about that. I think a lot of it depends on the complexity of the category because when, um, uh, if you're faced with complexity of choice and often when you, when you do a search on the internet, um, and a classic example is looking for insurance comparisons, you get the results back and there are hundreds. And what people tend to do under those conditions, because their pilot system, system two, is just overwhelmed and cannot process all of the, all of the data and all of the information, nor, nor do we want to, frankly. You know, who here, put your hands up, by the way, when you last got your Android or, or iOS uh, software update, you read all the terms and conditions before clicking agree. No, nobody, right? None of us do because it's too much effort. So when you get, if you're shopping, purchasing in a complex category, your system one or autopilot looks for shortcuts. And very often those shortcuts are things like reviews, also price. So in, in price comparison, what we've found is people tend to buy either the cheapest or the brand they know. And the cheapest, they might rationalize because it's got a lot of positive reviews. It's right. like, okay, I'm not taking a risk here, right? Lots of people have bought it. It's got, it's got lots of positive reviews. I've never heard of it, but all these people can't be wrong. And that's the power of that heuristic. So I think that's, that's probably the way it works in that. I think that's correct. What you told is absolutely right. I'll, I'll, I'll take off the other, as, as Louis says, I'll take off the other questions I had for Phil. Go ahead. I mean, someone else can... Thanks so much, Suresh, and thanks for your answers right. there, Phil. Yeah. Um, I have a question here from Jonathan. Um, I, can you hear us, Jonathan? You're not on camera, Jonathan Herkham. Or I can go ahead and read the question. I'll go ahead, Miss Jonathan jumps in, which is, um, he was looking, Phil, to know, could you speak to any mental models inspired by investor Charlie Munger, and also your thoughts on semiotic in marketing which is a very okay. broad broad area right I'm gonna <laughs> a bit like the book absolute value I'm gonna have to skip the first part of the question because I've got no idea what Charlie Munger has done and and that's sorry that's an awful confession but I will after this call I will I will search him out to find out so no I can't answer the question about mental models inspired by Charlie Munger uh, in terms of semiotics yes absolutely I mean I think um, this is what uh, this is what we call codes. Um, absolutely fundamental um, because what what brands do through all of their touch points uh, is send signals, um, and these these signals, whether it's you know, things like colours or shapes or icons or words and names, um, they all have a meaning, and that meaning is decoded uh, depending on the culture in which you you've grown up uh, by what the, the scientists call the statistics of the environment. Um, you know, and there are stark and significant cultural differences that we, um, we have to be aware of, particularly if we are marketing internationally. You know, I, uh, in, in Decode, we have a global network of local experts because we, you, we just know this is fact. I would not presume to try and decode something in a culture where I'm, I'm not native because I just, I just cannot get it, right? I just don't have those associations built. But semioticians are, um, are expert in, in, in that, in the, the meaning of signs and symbols and codes uh, and what it means in culture. So it's a, it's a crucial part of understanding mental processing. We, we use a very simple three-step model where we say, if a brand is, is creating touch points, and it doesn't matter what that touch point is, it can be an event, uh, it can be a digital ad, it can be price, what, pack, packaging, whatever it is. Um, 
those touch points represent data coming into the brain. The first bit of processing is attention and perception. We have to get into the brain in the first place. The last bit of processing is motivation. And uh, by the way, I'm taking these stepwise. There's, there's an awful lot of interrelationship, but just to keep it simple, at least for me as a humble marketeer, attention and perception at, at first, motivation at the end. And in the middle is this recognition part. This is where the brain decodes the incoming data and pattern matches using our associative memory to metaphorically answer que the questions like, what is it? What does it represent? Where do I know this from? And all of this happens in milliseconds at a, at a, at a non-conscious level. And that process of decoding is what semioticians do. Uh, and that's why it's absolutely critical that we know when, when creative agencies create something, whether it's an ad or a piece of packaging or design, that that something is going to have meaning. What it, and that meaning has to be what we intend it to be. You know, there, there have been awful examples where quite unwittingly people have created what they think is a great piece of design and it has a completely different meaning and in the example in the book i give the example of tropicana orange juice where they redesigned the advertising brief was for the new design to be fresher cleaner and more modern than the original design and it absolutely meets those criteria but the problem was that those criteria are totally irrelevant to purchase and what they did was change the signals they they took the juicy orange uh, off the original pack and replaced it with a fluted wine glass filled with orange juice and what the brain does when it's saying what is it what does it represent where do i know it from you know a, a juicy orange has just come from the tree it's just been plucked you can't get fresher more natural you can't get closer to the authentic juice but orange juice served in a fluted wine glass is com has a completely different meaning it's it's a special occasion. It's what I know from brunch or, or a hotel or a business meeting or a wedding or a bucks fizz or something like this. It's a very different meaning to a juicy orange. And that's where semi semiotics is absolutely crucial to understand that, that meaning. Thanks, Phil. I think there'll be a Google surge when we all come off this call, everyone going away to look up uh... Charlie Munger and his yeah. mental models. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, Bennett, would you like to ask your question um, about advertising? Sure, Louis. Um, I feel it is really an honor to uh, be speaking to you uh, from the client side. So I got into behavioral economics first, and then now I'm getting into marketing. So slightly different. Great. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, so the uh, so the question is. Um, so as we know that role of advertising is to build and refresh our memory structures, uh, I wanted to understand uh, what are some of the fundamental ways to build memory structures? Some thoughts around that. Mm. Well, Bene, I have to say it's an honor to meet you. Thank you so much for, for your time today uh, and great, great career move. Um, we, I wish you every success. Um, so mem memory, I mean, this, this is quite basically about human learning. And what I understand about human learning is it's based on um, something, well, a lovely phrase, what fires together, wires together, so-called heavy and learning. So what the brain does is when two things occur uh, and they occur more than randomly, then the brain starts to connect the two and build a, a neural network connecting those those two objects if they're just if it's just a random occurrence then it's kind of it's not significant but the more that those things can connect or, or occur together then the stronger the neural network connecting them and the faster the network and the the analogy i give in um in decoded is it's like a, a field of, of freshly laid snow and um, and as we walk across we leave foot, footprints connecting one part of the field to the next and as we retrace our steps and the more and more we do it the faster the path come, becomes to navigate uh, and easier it is to navigate so the the way to build memory structures and this is what we we say to all clients is it's about consistency 
and persistency. And that's how human beings learn. Now that doesn't mean that you need to have the same advert forever, because what you can do is to refresh the ad at the signal level, so the actual creative, as long as you keep the meaning consistent. So, and, and the example I give in Decoded is, is Axe um, body spray, where whenever they, they have a new fragrance or they extend Axe into a different product category, they have fresh creative, but it all has the same underlying meaning and it's linked back to the same neuropsychological goal. So even though we, you know, we see something new and that helps with learning as well, because we, um, the neurons will fire when there's some novelty, when there isn't, and we kind of see something we expect, then there's, there's no need for neural activity. So you don't get learning. But when you get some novelty, then we get learning. So or Lynx has got a new fragrance, Lynx has got a, a body spray or a shampoo or a body wash or whatever it might be. So we learn something new. We see some new creative, which might be entertaining as well uh, and have a positive valence from that point of view. But conceptually at the meaning level, we've kept that consistent. So we, we reinforce and strengthen that, that um, memory structure. And we know that memory structures exist for, for a long time, um, but they can decay when they're not refreshed. Um, but you, you, we've, you know, there are lots of examples, and we've, we've seen them with our own clients, where clients have brought back or resurrected um, advertising lines or, or actual creative content that they haven't used for five years, 10 years, longer sometimes, and it just sparks up again you know the the, the memory is still there uh, and you can do the same with you know with things you learn from the, from your childhood you can play a game with your friends and just you know start an advertising line and see who can finish it uh, and and you know, we can because because that memory that that associated memory structure is still there thanks so much phil and thanks, thanks for that great question Vinette. Um, so I'm just going to take one more question because I'm aware we've come up to the hour now. So um, Kathleen, would you like to ask your question? So um, a few years ago, a behavioral econo economist, Kenneth Chin, gave a TED talk on um, how language affects the brain and specifically looked at futured and futureless languages and that futureless languages, which for him were the Germanic, Scandinavian, Chinese, he was Chinese languages, um, do not use tenses to divide time and that therefore the reward system is actually could be delayed. Whereas futured languages like the Romance languages in English do divide time up and that we have a much we do need have an immediacy of a reward system and i was wondering if you'd ever looked into that and or the fact that most europeans who are educated can speak english maybe that has modified the, that future and futureless situation mm. Thank you, Kathleen. It's not a concept I'm familiar with. I have to say, I will, I will after the call, defer to my uh, academic colleagues to find out more about Kenneth Chin. Um, I would think, from what from what you've said, though, um, because what, one of the things we know is that uh, immediacy is is something that System One or the autopilot responds to uh, more strongly than something that is um, less certain and, and in the future. Um, so I would I would think that future less languages. Um, I'm, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Because if you have a future less language, then presumably you can't ever position a reward in the future, because the future conceptually doesn't exist. Um, so I wonder whether there would be a difference between the two. What he found, just briefly from the TED talk, what he found was that future less language speakers tend to save more money, tend to be healthier. Um, there were some other things. They, they just basically did not view the future as being way off. They viewed it as being just part of now, kind of. And right. so that they, okay. they behaved okay. in ways that were radically different. 
Ah, uh, right. Oh, that is interesting. And, and yeah, I can see that's, that's totally plausible because we know there's a concept of so-called hyperbolic discounting where we, if we have a future language uh, and, and, and a concept of, of that, um, that we don't act in the here and now because the, a lot of the pain uh, is, is discounted to the future. So things like smoking cessation or dieting, you know, I'm, I know smoking is bad for me, but yeah, it's, it might kill me in 40 years time, but right now I'm enjoying the cigarette or the burger or fries or whatever it might be. So I can certainly see that, that that's eminently plausible. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Thanks so much, Kathleen. That was a great question. And as always on these Saturdays, I'm going to go away like I think a lot of you are with scribbles all over my page of another half a dozen things to look up after the conversation. So um, it just remains for me to thank all of you for joining us again today. It's brilliant to see you all here and to send our thanks to Phil for his brilliant responses to all of the questions. Uh, it's been a joy to have you here, Phil, and you've been a most gracious guest. Um, and I'm just going to hand back to Prakash now to wrap up the event. Thank you, Louise, Michael, and uh, Phil. Uh, guys, uh, the book is available on Amazon. Uh, it's available on Flipkart for people who are shopping out of India. You've got the ebook version too. It's fantastic. Uh, it, it's one of my uh, favorites uh, from the world of marketing, from the world of behavioral science too, just because of the way the book is structured. Um, every time I want to go back and I, I have been reading this book, I think like four years now. Four years back, I found Decoded uh, when I was just doing my MBA. I keep on going back to the book and it's very easy when you want to do a second or third read, uh, you know, get your hand on it. And uh, Thank you so much, uh, Phil, for being a part of the Behavioral Science Club. And with your permission, uh, we'll probably put up this video online so that the remaining 2,200 people can take a look at it. And also people beyond uh, that number, they can, uh, you know, uh, learn from this discussion today. And Phil, any... Thank you. Well, listen, thank you, everybody. Um, it's, it's a Saturday and your leisure time. So I do appreciate your time uh, in attending this. Thank you very much. Um, some great questions. And what I'd like to offer is, if I didn't answer your question, I'm very happy to follow up on email. If anyone wants to contact me on phil at decode marketing, that's all one word, decodemarketing.com. I'd be very happy to continue the conversation. Thank you, Phil. Um, and for all of us out here, stay safe, wear your masks. Winter is coming. Yeah, it's the yeah. full season, so stay safe. Yeah. Uh, take care, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye, Bye. now, everybody. Bye, Bye, Phil. Bye. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Michael. Bye.